tried to warn them. They didn't listen. Yes! Every week, the Hoffman Show goes into the belly of the beast. We read those comments, baby. Never read the comments. All right, let's do it. There's a lot of lot of doozies this week, and we're gonna dive right in with our guy Cy Twelve, uh, talking about because obviously there's a lot of conversation. Uh, yesterday we had a caller segment talking about who do you want your head coach to be for the Commanders. Uh, got into a big whole EB side conversation. People talking about Ben Johnson, uh, a couple other names that came up as well. Side twelve says Detroit has a great O line where that creativity can work. Washington had a terrible O line with basically a late round rookie quarterback. Sam took unnecessary sacks because he was slow on Reeves, which is understandable with his lack of experience. And I hate this just run the ball BS. You just can't keep running the ball if you're always behind the sticks and behind on the scoreboard. And uh, how did Kansas City's offense look this year without EB? I'm not saying EB shouldn't be hired as head coach, but the slander is ridiculous. I hope the new coach sees EB's value and tries to keep him on staff. A couple things. Just on a factual basis, the Kansas City Chiefs finished ninth in total offense. They also would have finished higher if their receivers would have caught the ball. Like, that's not... I don't think EB's demanding presence would have led to more catches in Kansas City. Now, there's other things where perhaps he could have helped. EB's a phenomenal coach. He played an essential part in what they did. But they had a personnel, some personnel issues in Kansas City that dropped them down. Their scoring probably would have been higher, too, because... Lord knows there was a like what three weeks in a row where like the game winning touchdown was dropped. I think it was four or five times this year where a ga- a go ahead or game winning touchdown hit a receiver in the hands. Like that that's not a scheme execution problem or a scheme problem. That's a catch the bleeping ball problem. So yes, Eric Bieniemy was missed in Kansas City, but it's not like they were inept without him. So that's that's one thing. I think more so on the Washington side, there's just some stuff that like. People put forth as reasons why, like, people, uh, like, I'm being too harsh or others are being too harsh on Eric Bieniemy. when I'm like, no, that is actually the point. Like, the O-line graded out per snap, per drop back, middle of the league. Uh, you're, you know, so when you say, like, oh, their offensive line is terrible, like, no, it wasn't. And we talk about he had a late round rookie quarterback. yes. So why would you drop back past that guy? Because one, you you had more attempts than anyone else in football behind that O line and that with that quarterback. That's not good coordinating. No one said he had an easy job, but that's not good. And he also did it very little uh, threat of a run game, very limited use of play action. He didn't create the layups for Sam that other coordinators do. So they had personnel issues, but this is not a one-dimensional because their personnel wasn't good. You can't possibly fault Eric Bieniemy type of thing. When you're evaluating him, you can't say with a straight face, he did a good job. You can't just say, oh, it was hard, give him the head coaching job, or oh, it was hard, give him a pass. You look at the job that he took, which was his decision. He didn't have to come here. He took on that challenge. And he did a bad job. Not personal. Don't actually think he's a bad coach. I don't think this was a good fit for him. Something that became probably apparent to him very quickly. And I do think there are things that he tried to do that were repelled by whether it was other coaches, whether it was players. There's stuff that he... You didn't see the best of Eric Bieniemy this year. But you also didn't see anything... Like the decisions that he did make on a big macro level that were his calls were bad ones. And that doesn't get erased either. I'm just, I'm kind of, I can't wait till they have the next coach and we never have to talk about this again, if I'm being totally honest, which is why I appreciated this cart there, this comment from at DMV artist. He said, it's so entertaining. And this is the, the fun part. If you watch the show, Anthony, you get to see this every single day. Uh, Cause you, you watch me through the glass. You watch me on the screen. Um, he goes, it's so entertaining to see Craig's mind slowly lobotomize while talking to commanders fans. The things your average commanders fans will say. He has a list, Anthony. You ready for this? I'm ready. All right. Uh, We are tired of losing, but we want an OC who is coming off his worst year to be the head coach. Also, that same offensive coordinator didn't call all the plays while the Chiefs 
and he had one of the greatest quarterbacks ever. He comes here as the primary play caller, and he performs worse than Scott Turner, but please promote him to head coach. That is something that we do we hear, right? It is indeed. Uh, number two, there's four of these. These are all good. The Cowboys don't know if Dak is talented enough to win it all. The Dolphins don't know if Tua is good enough uh, either, and both of those players are coming off of great years. That being said, Commander fans are scared to move off of Sam Howell. You can't make this up. You can't make it up. When you put it that way, number three. For the longest uh, time, Commanders fans believed, and they probably still do, that Taylor Heineke is the second coming of Tom Brady. Taylor failed to get us in the playoffs for multiple years, but you have fans that think he was the key to us being good. Definitely a part of the fan base that's very loud that that has those thoughts. Yep. Sabah. <laughs> no comment. Uh, I love seeing, last one, I love seeing that all-star lineup of coaches we had. And even when we complained about the coaching, it wasn't until those guys, including Kyle Shanahan, went other places that we realized that we had some excellent coaches. If you remember, we couldn't wait to get Mike and his son out of here. It's like the same group of people that complains that none of those coaches were kept, wanted them fired at the time, and doesn't want a hotshot coordinator. How was that the same circle on a Venn diagram? I don't know, man. I don't know either. Uh, let's go. <laughs> this was a funny one. Uh, it, it was funny uh, in, in to me anyway. Mark Harris. Uh, Mike McDonald is my choice. Only con is I don't know what direction he and Adam would go with the offense. Anthony, that seems like a big con to me. That seems like an important question. <laughs> sort of, kind of. Yeah. Hey, what are you going to do on offense? <laughs> I don't know. And it's, it's it's funny just because the way it's worded. Yeah. Uh, shout out to Mark for watching the show. Um, but it is the question that obviously he'll have to answer in an interview. By the way, Ben Johnson is going to be have to answer who's your defensive coordinator going to be. Who what what do you want to run on that side of the ball? Do you have a specific thing you want to do? Like because that's a big decision because all of a sudden if you change four three to three four, like some of your personnel doesn't fit nearly as well. Um, like John Allen can play a five tech as an edge. Uh, or like a 3-4 uh, defensive end, but I don't know that I want to pay a 3-4 defensive end when he's getting paid. So he's, he's better being a three technique. So things like that. Um, obviously, uh, there was a race element to our conversation about Eric Bieniemy yesterday. And a lot of people saying like, this dude's been screwed. And I don't disagree uh, that it, based off his resume, he certainly deserves uh, to be a head coach. Um, but then, then two commenters... Uh, Came in on the anti B enemy side with some. I just I thought it was very funny. This is when when comedy is is great. At Mario Hart twenty six fifty one says, "Listen, I'm black as a thousand midnights, and I do not want E B around another young quarterback. He refused to run the ball. I promise you, the offensive players don't want him back. How many times did we have receivers running into each other? A lot of things are about race, but this ain't it. We have a very talented roster. It wasn't used to its maximum potential. It just wasn't. Ben Johnson can take our players." And make them a top 10 offense. I don't know that I would say this is a super talented offense. But it's more talented than it showed this year. And I'm black as a thousand midnights is a banger hilarious line. Yeah, that's a bar right there. That's funny. What do you think about this one? Uh, a guy DMV artist gets this. Well, in response to Mario. Uh, says, well, I'm blacker than Michael Blackson in a tub full of coffee. <laughs> What's wrong with people? I don't know, man. I think that's I I enjoyed the comedy. Uh, and he goes, "I'm sorry, I couldn't resist." Anyway, I strongly believe that one of the reasons Sam Howell regressed was due to how hard he was coached by EB. Instead of getting better, he looked like he was lost after a promising start. Whatever he did or didn't do, I don't want him doing that to our new rookie quarterback. I don't know about the in house coaching and I do think sometimes guys like tell themselves they really want to be coached hard and they actually it's not the best way for them to receive feedback and it's not about being soft it's not about this or that it's just like what's your learning style if if a coach is a teacher and is like super hard on people but he's got a bunch of people that respond to like auditory learning if they learn by hearing things like that might really work but if it's like, hey, man, I told you a thousand times. And it's like, well, I'm a visual learner. If you drew it once, you wouldn't have to tell me twice. Like, those are the kinds of things that you need to understand and have options as a coach. And so when EB would be like, oh, I do things my way. It's like, that's great if the people that you're working with also are compatible. And it's not something as a human being that you have control over. Your learning style is your learning style. 
So uh, that is something I wonder about. But I do think, obviously, the the way they used and deployed Sam, as I've talked about ad nauseum, I'm not going to go back over it again, is was, was a huge uh, reason why he regressed and was unable to grow this year. Uh, Brittany says Brittany D 9447 here on never read the comments again your YouTube comments at Craig Hoffman get you on the show uh we can name a lot of hot shot young coordinators that are successful remember when Anthony we had a caller yesterday try to tell us that no hot shot young coordinators are, are ever successful yeah as if every head coach in the league wasn't a former coordinator like there was a time Bill Belichick was a hotshot young defensive coordinator. Led the New York Giants, helped Bill Parcells lead the New York Giants to Super Bowl titles. Then he became a head coach. So I just, you know, also people, I hate retreads. Belichick's second time as a head coach was the Patriots. Just saying. Um, anyway, I'm now I'm going to get comments be like, Belichick didn't win without Brady. <laughs> He's got six Super Bowl rings as a head coach. Shut up. Uh, we can name a lot of hotshot young coordinators that are successful. Kyle, McVay, LaFleur. Come on, people. And being young means they have a higher ceiling. They've seen what these retreads have done, and they have been fired multiple times. That is also a good point that, hey, if you're a retread, that means you've had the job before and it didn't go well. The question I would have on the retreads is, what did you learn from the first time? I think Raheem Morris learned a lot. I think Dan Quinn learned a lot. I'd be very, very curious to see them. I think Vrabel's an excellent coach. He's also fresh off this. What has he learned? I don't know. Does he feel like he needs to learn? He needs to learn anything, or was the fact that his record went down the last two years just? Oh, I'm a victim of circumstance, which might be true. The front office made a bunch of wacky decisions there. If their goal was to win, so it, it is the retread game is interesting. Um, you know the the coordinator job is interesting, but either you've never done the job before or you don't have the job anymore. There is no other options. Like there, you can't trade for a head coach. Because if you have a good head coach, you're not like you can't call up the Rams and be like, "What's it cost to get Sean McVay?" They'd be like, uh, "Seventeen billion dollars." Josh is like, "I already spent six point one. We'll just go hire someone else." Thanks. We're all good on that. Um, getting into some of the other candidates and comments on them. Uh, Mr. Swervon, frequent commenter, says, I look at the Ravens defense and say it has a culture. Go back and look at Martindale. He had the second-ranked defense twice and third once. Go back before that, and they are always top 10. Not saying McDonald isn't good, but that culture of players and defense is always there. That is 100% true. Um, going back, obviously, Marvin Lewis back in the day uh, as defensive coordinator and that incredible 2000 defense that went that basically won them the Super Bowl um, all the way through. They you know, they, they had Hall of Fame players for damn near two decades, anchoring it in Ray Lewis and Ed Reed, and they continued that past that, which is incredible. Guys like Terrell Suggs, and they, they just, they continued to just have a culture about them that John Harbaugh inherited when he became the head coach and has continued on that side of the ball. There's just a toughness to that organization. Um, Ozzie Newsom building it, now Ernie DaCosta. Like, they're, they're exceptional at what they do. Now, the question I would have for Mike McDonald is, how do you bring that here? And if you can start establishing that, and that's the next 30 years of Washington football, incredible. We'll take the last 30 years of what Baltimore has done. Multiple Super Bowl appearances, always a contender. Like, that'd be, that'd be awesome. But it doesn't, like, just because it's not unique and he might have inherited it doesn't mean that he's not also of it and can't bring it somewhere else. Um, viral hip-hop news. Anthony, always love when we get uh, viral hip-hop news or other channels that provide news on other topics asking us questions on our channel. I think that's cool. Yeah. Uh, viral hip hop news says if the Lions lose in the conference championship and the Ravens move on to the Super Bowl, how does that affect McDonald's chances of becoming our head coach with Johnson floating around freely in your opinion? My opinion is it doesn't matter one freaking bit. Um, it would be awesome if the coach that you wanted was available now because next week is the senior bowl. And frankly, if Detroit loses this weekend, I would try to like, do they play the early game or the late game, Anthony? They play the late game. Damn. Like, if they play the early game, I want Johnson introduced at halftime of the late game <laughs> uh, or whatever it is. So, if it, hey, if it's McDonald and they lose in the early game, let's get him in here. Like, that would be amazing to be able to send your staff to the Senior Bowl 
you're saying your coach and, and has, spend some time with your scouts and you know you're down there you maybe get to do some hiring um all kinds of stuff gets set up that'd be that'd be great but the mo like the these two weeks can be made up you can watch all the senior bowl stuff is available on film you can watch the tape back and do the scouting later um you can you'll get your hires like there's the most important thing is getting the right person so right person now a plus right person later uh, slight slight disadvantage wrong person now huge disadvantage don't do that um lyle paradise uh commented on one of our videos from earlier this week one of my segments where i was talking about how you shouldn't judge uh the head coaching candidates just off of what they're doing in these playoff games that there is a deeper process that you will uncover in the interview process that double process there whoops uh that you will over undercover uh as you interview these guys that will lead you to understand who they are and how they will be as head coaches and lyle paradise 2764 says this is why i'm glad we have adam peters as the gm he's worked for organizations that have seen nothing but success while he was there so we should have a pretty good understanding on what it takes to build a winning culture by getting the right people in the right jobs will hiring a rookie head coach bring immediate results only time will tell, but so far I feel that he and the rest of the organization have gotten their act together, and that's something to feel good about for a change. I totally agree with that. Even the, the buttoned-up nature of this coaching search, there's not a lot of leaks. Like, yeah, we're hearing that that Ben Johnson's the guy from various people, and, and you know, like Boomer Esiason, for instance, said it on, on his show this morning up in New York, and he's like, ah, oh, it's done. And, like, Boomer's been around the NFL a long time. Here's hearing a bunch of rumors. He might be talking to agents or whatever. And, like, agents know everything. So I'm not saying that there aren't clear indications that he's their guy. But at the end of the day, they haven't done the interviews yet. And I think one of the things that I really like about a guy like Adam Peters is he's going to respect the process. The reason he doesn't have a favorite yet is because he hasn't completed the process. He's got early impressions. He's not going to share them with anyone. And ultimately, if he sits down next week with Mike McDonald, with Anthony Weaver, with Aaron Glenn, and those guys blow him away, and he's like, you want to know what? My gut tells me that this guy's got it together more. This guy's the better coach, not Johnson. I know why everyone likes Ben, but I'm going to go with Aaron Glenn. He'll do it. They'll follow the process, and they'll run out the ground ball all the way till the end. And you can't know until you do the interview. And so... um, I appreciate that a lot about Adam Peters, and it's and that kind of person has never been here in Washington. It's been a bunch of narrative chasing, and that's not just like a reference to Ben Standing's article on Ron Rivera. That's been Daniel Snyder's entire tenure. Uh, last but not least, this is a, a bit off topic, but um, I thought it was interesting and uh, worthy of responding to. Wild Bill 0072. So it's not a secret agent, Anthony. Not, not 007. 0072 says... Just curious, who gives up on a young QB first? Is it the media, the team, team management, or the fans? I note that Baker Mayfield and Jared Goff were both written off as, quote, someone who will eventually be a good backup somewhere, and yet they both beat previous media darlings Stafford and Hurts. Same thing for Love and Dak or Geno Smith. Seems like media is always willing to give up on a QB first when we haven't heard anyone from the team or management chime in. With a 24th ranked offensive line and a receiver core that ranked 31st in separation, as well as the defense that ranked dead last, the laser focus of the media might be a little less focused on QB. Lots of blame to spread around and plunking another QB into this team as it currently stands, even if it's the most important position on the team, will not produce wins. So first of all, I, I think that people struggle with the idea that you can do multiple things at once. And like, this is a... Uh, this is a societal issue. I don't know how deep I want to get with this. We're at the end of the segment. Probably just going to get me in trouble. So I'll just, I'll stay fairly surface level. Um, multiple things can be true at once. And not every problem is simplified into blaming one person. There are times that is true. But often multiple factors and multiple things can be true at once. Commanders O-line can be great it, or it can not be great it can also be not as bad as people think because the quarterback didn't do certain things uh the coordinator didn't do certain certain things the receivers separation numbers are an indicator that they didn't have very good years but if you 
were to have a different play calling scheme and featured more play action where guys ran wide open, then their separation numbers would look better. This is why it's important to respect people with expertise. This is why I do a podcast twice a week with Logan Paulson, and when he watches the film and he shows me something, I go, oh, okay. I don't go, no, Logan, my feelings tell me something else. I go, oh, okay, I get it. And it's why if you're going to use data and statistics, you better understand what they are. I'm tired of hearing about the separation rate thing. I don't know how that number is compiled, but I watch the film and I see times where if you measured it now, the separation isn't very good. If you measure it now, the separation is good enough that a ball should be there. And it's not because the quarterback doesn't throw with anticipation, for instance, in a specific example. And again, a second later, it's it's the routes closed down again. But the guy came open in timing and the ball wasn't there. And if depending on when which frame, one, two, three, you take that that measurement in in terms of yards of separation, you're gonna have different a different number. And again, if if you have a schemed open, wide open, no one within 15 yards of you, like happens to Christian McCaffrey and Debo Samuel and Brandon Ayuk in San Francisco all the time. Are they actually better separators or do they win with the pen in San Francisco more often? And that helps their separation numbers. It's all like, and those things happen, not black and white. Yes and no, they happen on varying levels. And so to the larger point about quarterback and who gives up on them first, like we all see the results and media often is responding to what we're told by people who actually work for the teams. So, yeah, they're not going to hold a press conference and be like, our guy sucks, because that would involve them admitting that they made a mistake publicly, which nobody ever does, because we're afraid of shame in America uh, instead of afraid of being wrong. And instead, they'll go to some reporter and be like, yeah, we definitely messed it. Like, yeah, we're probably going to go in a different direction. And then it looks like the media gave up on him and fans have been booing him for two weeks anyway. And then it's like, oh, everyone's out ahead of the teams. Why is everyone so mean to this guy? And it's like, do you watch the games? So, yeah, I, I think media is often a mirror. It reflects what people who actually know stuff are saying. And there's another part of media that is merely a reflection of what fans are saying. And not to say that there aren't plenty of people that have their own opinions, but typically they either know stuff or they're just fans themselves. I think that's important to keep in mind. Uh, when we get back on the Hoffman Show, as that was, never read the comments. Uh, you can leave your comment. We'll respond to it on YouTube at Craig Hoffman or here on the show at the Team 980. We stream live every single day and highlights go up nightly at those YouTube spots. So make sure you're subscribed to both. What's up, kiddos? It's your boy Clinton Yates from ESPN. It's the Hoffman Show on the Team 980. Tell your mama I said what's up.